My name is Jace Golczak. I am a chief executive officer of Philip Morris International. So Philip Morris International for many years have been known as the cigarette maker, the global leader in a cigarette uh, category. And for the last 10 years, we've been known for the company which wants to transform its uh, purpose fully to unsmoke the world, to replace the cigarette with the safer, much better alternatives, the smoke-free products, different categories and so on. When I was young, I was playing in a band. I was playing on the bass guitar. I actually think if not Philip Morris, I could have been a very successful musician. What was my motivation to learn English at the time? My motivation was zero, but there was a huge persis persistence of my father and the mother who were forcing me to learn English. And I was questioning, what's the purpose of learning the language which you have no opportunity to use? Because Poland, as you know, were behind the Iron Curtain and you know you couldn't travel, you didn't have any access to the foreign media, etc. So fast forward actually I owe it very much to my parents that I cave in and I listen to them and uh, learn the learn the language. I joined Philip Morris more than 30 years ago in the finance department. They always wanted to have a finance career. But the Philip Morris have somehow helped me realize that the other aspects of the business than just the finance. So I was moving from operations, through sales, many other roles in the company. And then, you know, fast forward, really fast forward, 30 years later, I am at chief executive office. I don't regret anything what has happened to me, but I do admit that very often when I was changing the roles, I found it very difficult to change is not something which we like to do. We always will admit and claim that we're open to changes, but the reality is we don't like to change. Somehow with the help of Philip Morris, they navigated or helped me navigate the career, so I ended up where I am. I learned how to smoke when I was in the last years of my university, so it was before, the, before Philip Morris, and I was a smoker for more than 20 years. My predecessors who started investing into the smoke-free products still when you know, science was not there, technology innovations was not there, but we had the desire to address the problem of smoking. So if you know that the cigarettes are so harmful, is there a way that you could reduce the harm created by cigarettes. Ten years ago, when we started more sh sharing more with the public, our uh, vision to go smoke-free and we were showing, demonstrating the product, and there were more the questions than answers, and a lot of people were skeptical. Will it work? Will it be accepted by the smokers? What is the science behind it? <laughs> Take one. One, two, three. So I joined uh, PMI about five years ago. It was a difficult decision because I'm not a smoker. I'm a health freak. And uh, I was not even thinking that a tobacco company would be uh, the horizon uh, for me. There's a lot of skepticism, distrust, and maybe even dislike because, oh my gosh, what is the tobacco industry doing in a scientific debate? And I have to admit, I was one of those people. When I came to interview for the company, I was like, if they think I'm going to say smoking doesn't cause death and disease, they're completely wrong. So look, there's been a debate around better alternatives to cigarettes in the US since the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. There's even books written about it in the late 90s. One of them was called clearing the smoke, simply because we've known for decades that cigarettes cause diseases and are addictive. So the question, can we do something for those who don't quit, has always been there. What was missing was the technology, the science, to come up with that alternative in a way that consumers like. But it's approximately in 2008 that we realized we could do it. The battery technology had evolved, the science had evolved. We realized at that time that we could invest more and accelerate the pace of change. And we've invested over $10 billion since 2008 in research, development, manufacturing. I mean, 99% of our entire R&D, so research, development, product development, etc., the resources are today behind the smoke-free product. So we completely de-investing cigarettes because we perceive, we, we consider them as the faster we get rid, frankly speaking, of cigarettes, the better it is for the public, for the smokers, for the people who smoke and for the company. First, you know, growing up, I thought once people know that smoking is bad for you, it will just disappear. 
then as I went through my education and into my career, I realized despite the fact that smoking is harmful, people continue to smoke. That's the hardest thing to get as a scientist. <laughs> if you put the science out there that proves smoking is bad, you think you've solved the problem. So coming up with a product that's less harmful is one thing, but actually convincing people to make that tough behavioral change and actually giving up cigarettes is even harder. <laughs> that was the biggest challenge that we faced, but even as a scientist realizing that you have to face it was difficult. The ambition of the company is to basically phase out cigarettes around the world. And how do we phase out cigarettes? We do it by applying the deposition of the company is if you don't smoke, don't start. If you smoke, quit. If you don't quit, change. And this means change to smoke-free products that are scientifically substantiated to be better alternatives. Cigarettes and use something that's, that's harmful for you. And, and ICOS has a number of benefits. If you think about the three families of smoking-related diseases, when it comes to cardiovascular diseases, you immediately see clinically the improvement. Respiratory, same thing, because you don't have solid particles that stick to your lungs. On cancer, you will need more time because those diseases develop over time, but all what we see points in the direction of a significant reduction. So ultimately, the change is real. I mean, if you ask, if you have friends who used to smoke and move to ICOS, ask them how they feel. Say hello to new ICOS heat control technology. When uh, the smoke-free products were first commercialized uh, under the brand ICOS, uh, in Japan and in Italy. Nine years after, there are 27 million users of ICOS around the world. When you talk to a, an ICOS user, most of the time they say, ICOS changed my life. Look, you're always going to the completely new territories to the uncharted waters. Nobody has done a, such a transformation. Nobody has done a transformation at the scales and the size of our company. So yes, obviously, yes, you you know a lot of things ahead of your organization so you can demonstrate to yourself even that this vision has the high degree of a realism that is this realistic vision however the fact of of the life is you're jumping into the territory which nobody ever jumped before but if you believe into something it actually prompts you to have this courage to build on this and you have to be very open-minded in a sense you're making a lot of assumptions you have to verify them in a almost in a real time take a lesson incorporate improve 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 so what we know about the smoke-free products compared to what we knew 10 years ago we most likely wouldn't start the transformations 10 years ago but the fact that we know so much about the smoke-free products today is because we started 10 years ago learn how to swim without going to the water without knowing how to swim you may watch the youtubes but you only have a perception of the view how to swim so each of us have learned swimming by stepping into the water without knowing how to swim and this is exactly what is happening in philip morris or happened in philip morris 10 years ago we have about 700 people that work in this R&D center. But as a company, we have now over 1,500 people globally that either are doing science, doing research, or supporting the company in order to allow us to do the research. When I started here at PMI, I was really in charge of building a data management and biostatistics function that could do the clinical research, which ultimately was submitted around the world to regulators to allow the product to be marketed. When I started with the company, we were doing maybe one clinical trial every couple of years, and we built up the organization to be able to conduct eight clinical trials in parallel. So a complete transformation and focus on science for an organization who has never been that focused on science before. And in the end, in 2018, I got to defend the science to the US FDA's Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee. So I got to answer all the questions that they asked. I got to defend the science and ultimately, in 2020, we got the authorization for a modified risk tobacco product with reduced exposure claims. And I think that was my most exciting moment. It will take decades to eventually get to a point where people abandon um, cigarettes. 
We can't really tell if they will abandon nicotine as well, but at some point that may not become the issue anymore. For now, we need to be focused on replacing cigarettes with smoke-free alternatives. But in parallel, we are building a new line of business because now we have 1,500 scientists who work with us all time. We have capacity capability that we didn't have before. We bought companies in the healthcare and wellness space. So we're actually also building a new line of products in the healthcare and wellness that potentially will become additive to what we already have. But again, I think speculating further than a few decades would really be too much. And humanity has always used nicotine, so let's see where it heads. You could still have an opinion about the companies from the past, but it's also, up, I think, needed that you know your people open their minds and judge us what are we doing today and how much already we contribute to resolving the problem of smoking rather than you know keep on telling us that we shouldn't trust the tobacco company at the end of the day it's not a company it's the people who are in the company you watch the actions you judge them on the actions and you have to go and reformulate, reformulate your opinions everyone everyone has the right to change when they're depriving either individuals or the companies from the right to change, to transform, is actually slowing the progress with the negative consequences in the society. I mean, the key achievement is that, you know, if somebody would have told us 10 years ago that we will, you know, have more than a 20 million fully converted ICOS users, that we will have a 10 billion revenues, 10 billion dollars revenues coming from smoke-free products, that, you know, we will have a one-third of our revenues and the total group is a very, very large company coming from smoke-free products, you would be skeptical how realistic it is. So, I think we have met, made so many, so much progress on the smoke-free journey so far, despite the fact that here and there one could expect maybe we should get the more support, but we're not complaining. However, I think that also comes now the, you know, the next 10, 10 years period that I think more people should be happy of the progress which we have made. I'm not talking people in the company, but people externally being encouraged that in many markets we have reduced the smoking rates by the degree which was never achieved in the past by deploying all the conventional ways of addressing the problem of a combustible smoking. You know, people should, more people should open their minds and look very objectively what we have and what big opportunities for, for everyone around. Because these are not only smokers, they're people who smoke, but also their families, their kids, their wives, their husbands. Uh, everyone around somehow is impacted by the problem of smoking. And therefore, we should all celebrate the progress that we're going smoke-free. I am not that much worried about the prospect of Philip Morris, but my objective today is focus on what we have achieved today and build on a current success. There is still more than a billion smokers in the world, with us converting today 20, fully converting 20 million uh, smokers. We barely scratched the barrel of the opportunities which lies in front of Philip Morris, and it's my job that we stay on this course. And it's very important in a business also that you have a one mega big opportunity and make sure that you're very successful in addressing this opportunity. There might be other opportunities which are popping up on the longer term horizon, so you keep them a little bit aside. It doesn't mean that you don't invest, but you cannot reprioritize and lose the focus of what is the immediate biggest opportunity in front of us and also for the society. Well, if you believe in something, go for it. You know, we sometimes try to overcomplicate the things in our thinking, not realizing that there is a degree of, of the thinking and whatever is the design of the product, service, process, etc., that you will never have a 100% guarantee that something can be successful. If you had a 60-70% sort of a probability that this might lead to the, you know, to the success product, go for it because the rest you will learn from the consumers. And the faster you go and serve the consumer, then you start improving and learning. And very often people are worried that there is a risk of the failure. But the fact that you're not doing anything is the highest risk of the failure because you essentially change nothing. So if you believe into something, you do your homework, you go and run and you're gonna win.